I am Roy Frumkus, and that is the correct pronunciation. There's only one Frumkus family in the United States, so anyone you run across with that name is related to me. Although some of them call themselves Frumkeys. My grandfather was Houdini's agent, and so from the time I was a child, I was regaled by all his stories of vaudeville. And um, I don't know what happened <laughs> between then and the time I started making films, but my, my grandfather loved me and wanted the best for me, but never could quite figure out what those horrifying scripts were that I was writing. I, I felt bad that we didn't have a connection down the line, you know? But he was definitely my motivation. I had a student at the School of Visual Arts. His name was Jimmy Muro. And that in the first class that I had him for, which was a freshman production class, he came striding up glad handing me, hi, Jimmy Muro, you know, and the other guys are saying, oh, God, what a brown nose. But I liked him. There was something genuine about him. And in second year, uh, he and a few of the other guys did a short called Street Trash. It was shot on 16 millimeter, and it uh, was really primitive. But it, he was showing it in after-hours clubs around New York. And it was getting enormous responses, uh, really, really going over well. And uh, someone who saw it there, a guy named Terry Levine from Aquarius Films, offered him 50000 to add another hour to it, you know, filling it out to be a feature. And he came to me, I, I still had him as a student, now it was second year, and he was in my screenwriting class. And he said, man, you know I can't write, it's not one of my strengths, would you write the script? Now, also, an uncle had died, left him some money, and he had gone and bought the apparatus for a steady cam. And I said, Jimmy, I think you'd like this film to look a lot better than what you're being offered. So why don't I write it, why don't I produce it as well, and raise the kind of money to support the kind of film that you really like to make. And that was the evolution of Street Trash. I created the Substitute franchise, which is, in Hollywood, that is the most desirable thing a person can do. Um, you know, we were talking earlier off, off set about uh, Doubt, uh, which is a good film, but there's not going to be a Doubt 2 and a Doubt 3. It's just not that, it's not a franchise, you know? But if you can write a script that has built-in sequels, uh, Hollywood really gloms onto you. And I had written The Substitute uh, some years before it got made as a film I wanted to produce as a follow-up to Street Trash with Bill Chappell, the cop, playing the mercenary, you know, using a lot of the same people. Sometime after that, I, I got a writing partner, and he was looking through my scripts, and he saw The Substitute, and he said, God, this would be a great franchise. You've got, you got to change the ending. You can't die in the end. So I said, all right, you fix the ending. So my writing partner, Rocco, did this whole ending where he lives in the end, and they're off to another school at the end. So I still couldn't sacrifice my ending, which was kind of a blaze of glory, you know, dying in a blaze of glory. So I did my ending, and then you would turn the page, and, and the whole page would be one little word, or. Then you turn the page, and it was his ending. Later we heard that in Hollywood they were ripping my ending out, because everyone that was reading it knew the only thing that was, you know, that they wanted was a franchise. And it went very quickly. I mean, it, it got picked up very quickly. So I, I, I wrote with Rocco for 19 years, and I always referred to him as my Hollywood conscience. You know, he, he understood where to take my street trash ethic <laughs> and kind of try to bottle it, you know, and, and subdue it a bit. I have written a script for Street Trash 3. Now, there was no 2, but I just think that 20 odd years is too long, you know, so I, I've, I've moved past 2, and we're on to 3. And uh, I have commitments. Uh, from everyone, and even a kind of a commitment from Jimmy Muro to direct. But he's an awful busy guy, you know. He, after Street Trash, he became, I guess, the, the world's premier Steadicam operator. And uh, that went on for many years, and then he decided to move up, you know, a notch into director of photography, and his first film was Open Range. And, and I like the film, but that's the best thing about the film, is the look. And from there he did Crash, which, I mean, you, you could not do a film further away in terms of visual look. So the guy is just flexible as can be and a great DP. And I don't know whether, whether timing and all is going to sync up, but all the original actors from Street Trash, who are still alive, are on board. When we did Street Trash, 
in order to coerce or seduce the investors, uh, I had to show them something comparable. And what we used was uh, Repo Man and Blood Simple. Those were the two films that were closest to the kind of renegade nihilistic spirit uh, that we were going for. And they were indie films and they were done cheap, you know? Uh, they found their market. You know, I was able to reduce pages from variety and show that they were both making money pay week after week. I could highlight them on the top 50. And uh, uh, Slime City Massacre is going to serve the same purpose, obviously, because it is, it is so similar in that it is um, that kind of a, a return to a cult favorite, something that's persisted over the decades, you know? And it will uh, do better than the first one. It's inevitable that it will. The market has changed so drastically. You know, the, the availability of ancillary media today it far exceeds what existed back in 1988 for Slime City or 1987 for Street Trash. So, yeah, I think it'll help. And my character's name is uh, Roger Crump, and I can't help thinking, or Ronald Crump, and I can't help thinking that it's, it reminds me of a, some guy, a real estate magnet. I can't quite put my finger on it, but um, I, I studied his, uh, his way of dressing, and, and this has nothing to do with his way of dressing, but I, there was an earlier scene today that was more reminiscent of the character that my character is based on. Well, I liked it when I read it. Um, I then started seeing your postings on the internet, and I thought it was being visualized far beyond what the page contained. I mean, I was really impressed. And uh, I mean, I always wished Greg the best, you know, but he's just uh, had that magic, that luck uh, that you either get or you don't get on a project. You know, Chaplin uh, said that, that the magic of films is in between the frames. It's not what you're seeing. It's something else. And uh, this seems to have that. I did see him directing a little bit on your uh, internet, you know, documentaries that you've been putting up. And today I've watched him do it, and he's like extremely confident, easygoing. Um, a director is responsible for doing something that practically can't be taught. You know, it's one thing to teach f stops and, and blocking and things like that, but there's a kind of a of a psychiatrist role that a, that a director plays. That he has to uh, he has to like pump everyone up, and it doesn't have to be in a rah rah way. But he's got to understand the psyches of everyone in the cast and crew and keep them working on all pistons, you know? I, th I actually think he's got it. I was watching him today and, and it was like very effortless. I don't know that he had it way back then, you know? But, but I, I did see it working. So, um, so I wondered if I hadn't made a mistake taking this on. Well, that's a race today. I'm having a time in my life. I am witnessing what I think is going to be a, another cult classic, and I'm thrilled to have been here.